Right now, as a church, we are going through challenges, but this is what's happening. We are coming out victorious. And how do we do that? We continue to praise God and worship God. See, anyone can praise God when things are going good, and anyone can thank God when everything is perfect. But true faith worships God in the difficult times. And I'm so proud of our church. That's exactly what we've been doing. Today, we're going to dive into a, a, a story in the Bible about Jesus visiting his hometown. Not too many times does Jesus visit his hometown. This was the town he grew up in. Right before Jesus visits this town, he does all types of miracles. A matter of fact, he's on a, he's on a ministry circuit. He's going from town to town, from coast to coast. And this is what's happening in every town. People are getting healed. They're being set free. And the last town he went to, there was a little girl that even was raised from the dead. And as he's going into his own hometown, you would think that they would have a parade waiting for Jesus. But that's not really what happened. And we're going to dive into that story right now. And we're going to discover some truths about believing and not believing. So the title of this sermon is this, Believe It or not? And that's the question. Believe in God or not believe in God is what this whole life is going to come down to. Let's look at this story in Mark chapter 6, verse 1. It says this, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. So he's coming into his hometown. I would think he's a hometown hero. But that's not what you're going to see in this story. This story ends up being a real sad story of the condition or the belief of the people that were living in that town. The next Sabbath, verse 2, he began teaching in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Think about this, refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. Jesus was celebrated, really, in almost every single town he went to. There were crowds just waiting for Jesus. He comes to his hometown and he doesn't get that hometown welcome. Verse 5 says, and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few people and heal them. Verse 6, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Let's discover four truths in this story about believing or not believing. Truth number one, no one will ever believe in Jesus without hearing about Jesus. This is why Jesus came to his hometown. Do you think that he went to his hometown just to visit his family? No, Jesus was on a mission. And his mission was to save souls, do miracles, heal the brokenhearted. This was an assignment of love. Jesus got out of his comfort zone and would go from town to town to comfort people's hurts, pains, and hopelessness. And this is a fact, truth. No one will ever believe in Jesus without hearing about Jesus. See, everywhere Jesus went, he taught and preached. This was the method. This was, this was the pattern. He would preach, and this is what happened next. People would believe, and then miracles would happen. But there would be no belief without preaching first. Jesus never did miracles first and then preach. He would always preach, and then miracles would happen. In Romans 10, 14, it says this. How, how then will they call on him if they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? These are really three or four rhetorical questions. And the real question is driving a point home. How can someone believe if they've never heard? And how can someone hear without someone preaching? And who's going to go preach unless someone 
sends them. We have an assignment, and this is a reality. No one will ever believe in Jesus, receive salvation, receive freedom without someone opening up their mouth and telling them about Jesus. This church, the Way World Outreach, started around 15 years ago, but the reality, it started decades before the church started. How did the church start? Well, there was a young lady that lived in Mexico, and she took on an assignment to preach the good news about Jesus Christ. She took a trip to the Virgin Islands, far away, thousands of miles away. Why is she coming to this little island all the way from Mexico? She has an assignment like Jesus had an assignment to reach a city, to reach a town, to maybe reach a few people and let them know about Jesus. This young lady, what she did when she got to the Virgin Islands, a little island called St. Croix, that's where me and my family grew up, she started knocking on doors. She comes from Mexico, knocks on doors with a mission to save souls and tell people about Jesus. She knocked on my mother's door. It was, it was a early in the morning on a Saturday and she opened, my mom opens up the door and she sees this little Mexican girl and she, my mom said, yes, how can I help you? And she says, I would like to invite you to church tonight. I'm going to be preaching. And my mother could not believe that that little girl was going to be preaching. So she said, I got to see this. You're going to be preaching? And she says, yes, I'm going to be preaching. I would love for you to come. And my mother said yes to the invitation. And this is what happened. That young lady sang and then she preached a message about Jesus Christ. And that day, that very day, after my mom heard that message, she ran up the aisle and she gave her life to Jesus. That's how the Way World Outreach began. I've never met that young lady, but that young lady, one day we'll see her in heaven and she's gonna see my mama in heaven. And that happened because someone was bold enough to mention the name of Jesus. Now Jesus, when he shows up to town, Nazareth, or everywhere he went, he would also do this. He would take his disciples with, them, with him. Why would he take his disciples with him? Because he was training them to do ministry just like him. So he went to Nazareth to preach so people would get saved and their faith would be built and do miracles. But he also was training his disciples. They went with him as well. And after he trained them, this is what Jesus did. He sent them out to do the very same thing he did. Let's look at the scripture in Mark 16, 15. And then he told them, Jesus told the disciples, after he trained them, go into Nazareth was part of the training. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. What are you saying? Everywhere you go, just like I'm doing, I'm going from city to city, from town to town, from coast to coast, and I'm preaching the good news. I'm building their faith. You do the same. Go everywhere, just like I did. Preach. Let them know about me. And the scripture says, verse 16, and anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Look at this, look at this statement or this command. After the preaching, people believe or they refuse to believe. Here we go. Believe it or not. Those that believe are saved, are set free, have eternal life. And those that do not believe do not have an experience with God. That day when, when that little girl from Mexico came to the Virgin Islands, St. Croix, and knocked on my mother's door, that was the day that my mom heard the good news. And that was the day that she believed, she got baptized, and she was saved. And one day, I'm gonna catch up with her in heaven. She passed away this last year, but we'll see her again because someone went out of their way and preached the good news of Jesus. Remember, truth number one, no one will ever believe in Jesus without hearing about Jesus. Believers, that's why we're here. 
That's why we're even inviting our family and friends to our house so they can hear about Jesus. We're living in a world that's full of fear, full of pain, full of hurt. They don't know what to do. We have the answer. His name is Jesus Christ. And what's the reward for preaching? This is the reward. Is people believing and receiving eternal life. I remember when I was working in the car business, I used to tell everyone I knew about Jesus. There wasn't an employee that did not hear about Jesus. Well, one day, one of my salespeople, he, his mother got really, really sick. She was so sick that they were giving her hours to live. He goes, can you please go visit my mother before she dies? She doesn't know Jesus. I go, I sure will. He goes, but there's a problem. She's in a coma. I, I, I don't know if she could hear you, but if you could just come in and share the good news like you did with me, maybe she could hear and receive Jesus and be saved so I could see her in eternity. Well, I went over to that hospital in Moreno Valley. I walked into that room. And when I walked in that room, I saw her. She was in a coma. It was true. And then I began to just pray before I began to tell her the good news about Jesus Christ. There's power in this message. There's power to save a soul. While I started praying, a miracle happened. Her eyes opened up. She was coherent. And then I told her, can you hear me? Do you understand me? She shook her head. She held my hand and I told her, I'm going to tell you the most important message you've ever heard. This message will give you eternal life, will forgive you of every one of your sins. And you no longer need to fear death. Today's your moment. And I shared the good news with her. She said a prayer. She gave her life to Jesus. And it wasn't an hour later. She went back into the coma and she passed away just a few hours later. But the reward of sharing the good news about Jesus is souls being saved for eternity. Look at the scripture in John 4, 36. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. There's nothing more rewarding than leading someone to Jesus and helping them build a faith, a saving faith, so they can receive the free gift of eternal life. The reality is we cannot take anything with us. I can't take my cars with me. I can't take my clothes with me. I can't take my money with me. But this is what I can take with me. I can take souls with me into eternity. And this is what I, what I, what I could also take is the investment I've made in souls. Every investment I've made in a soul, I take that into eternity as well. So truth number one, no one will ever believe in Jesus without hearing about Jesus. And that's why Jesus went to this, his hometown. So they would believe and be saved. But truth number two, it's sad, but it's true. Not everyone who hears will believe. Not everyone who hears will believe. In Mark 6, 2, let's go review that. The, the next Sabbath, he began teaching in synagogue and many heard him and were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform, to perform such miracles? Then, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Not everyone who hears believes. I'll even go on to say this. You can be amazed by Jesus and still not believe in him. The scripture says that they heard and they were amazed. They were amazed by his wisdom and they were also impressed by the miracles that he did. No one on the whole earth was speaking like him and no one was doing miracles. They were seeing miracles for the first time. They were not just seeing miracles in their hometown. They were seeing miracles all over the surrounding areas. And they were beginning to ask because they were hearing this good news or they were hearing about Jesus or hearing Jesus preach. They began to be amazed. I mean, their faith began to grow, but there was also a battle for their faith. See, you can be amazed 
and still not believe. You know what that means? There's a lot of people that are impressed with Jesus, but they've not made a decision to follow Jesus yet. They believe, man, he's a great teacher. I'm with Jesus. They even walk, maybe walk around with a cross on their neck, but they've never surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. It's not enough to be impressed with Jesus. There has to be a day that we place our trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Truth number two, not everyone who hears will believe. See, unbelief is contagious. That's why we need to be aware who we're associating with and having conversations with. We usually think like the people we're hanging around with. We do influence each other. The whole town all thought the same thing about Jesus. Yes, a few of them, many of them were amazed, but then they went back to their belief, how they all thought. Imagine a whole town thinking the same. How did the whole town think the same? How did the whole town get filled with unbelief? This is how they did it. They were just talking with each other. Instead of talking faith, you know what they were doing? Talking themselves out of believing. Today, either we're talking ourselves into believing in Jesus, or we're, this is what we're doing. We're talking ourselves out of believing in Jesus. And one of the ways to build doubt is to hang around a whole bunch of people with doubt. Look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, don't let yourselves be deceived. Can we be deceived? Yes, because if we're not believing the truth, this is what's happening. We're believing a lie. And even if we believe the lie, it doesn't make it true. And even if we're surrounded with a whole bunch of people that agree with our lie, it still doesn't make it true. The reality is every single person one day will stand before God. And the only thing that's going to matter at that time, did we place our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior? So the scripture says, don't let yourself be deceived talking about things that are not true. It, talking about things that are not true is bound to reflect, be reflected in practical con conduct. Come back to your senses and don't dabble in sinful doubts. Don't dabble in sinful doubts. At least don't entertain sinful doubts. Remember that there are men who, are, who have plenty Men who have plenty to say about, say, but have no knowledge of God. There are people that have a lot to say, but there's a problem. They have no knowledge of God. Could it be that our faith is being crushed because we're hanging around a whole bunch of people that have no faith in God and they're influencing our belief? And the scariest thing about it is this, they could influence our belief and cancel our eternal life, forfeit the opportunity that's being presented to us. So they asked the right question, where did Jesus get all this power? But this was, is what they did. Instead of believing, you know what they started doing? They started talking themselves out of Jesus. Instead of being believing and receiving eternal life, they refused the belief and started scoffing at Jesus. They scoffed. You know what scoff means? It means this, to ridicule, to make fun of. It means to belittle, minimize, to portray as less impressive or, or, or important or depreciate. Instead of appreciating Jesus, they started minimizing him. And this is what they began to say. They began to talk themselves out of believing in Jesus. While they were talking themselves out of believing in Jesus, they were talking themselves out of their breakthrough. They were talking themselves out of their freedom. They were talking themselves out of the restoration. They were talking themselves out of eternal life. And this is what they began to say. They said this, he is just a carpenter. The reality is people weren't coming to Jesus with broken furniture. They were coming to Jesus with broken lives and Jesus was healing them. They were saying he's just a carpenter. That wasn't true at all. He was teaching in their synagogue, in their church. Carpenters were not teaching in churches. Only rabbis or prophets or teachers were allowed to teach in a synagogue. Jesus was teaching. The fact that he was teaching proved that he was more than a rabbi. I mean, more than a, more than a carpenter. But think, think about this. What carpenter do you know that's raising the dead, healing the sick, and, and giving life to paralyzed limbs? 
Jesus was more than a carpenter. He was a healer. He was a savior and a master communicator. This is the other thing that they said. He's the son of Mary. Now, what an interesting statement that they would be making. Because usually when they would talk about a lineage of anyone, they would mention the father. In Matthew 11, 2, it says, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and, and of Abraham. In verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Anytime they mention a lineage, they would never start with the, with the mother. They would always start with the father. And I think what they were trying to do was belittle Jesus by saying, you know who her mother is? Little Mary from our neighborhood. Nothing significant has ever happened in that family. You know her. She's not really a nobody. And they were trying to ridicule or belittle Jesus and just say, he's the son of Mary. But they, were, but they didn't know this. They were actually prophesying. That, see, because the Bible says that Jesus would come from a woman. It didn't say Jesus would come from a man. It said he would come from a woman, that he would come from a virgin. Look at this. This was said 700 years before Jesus showed up. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Listen carefully. The virgin will conceive and give birth to the son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Though they were trying to belittle Jesus, they were actually pointing to prophecy. The son of Mary. Well, that's what the Bible says. He would come through a virgin and his name would be God with us. And the third statement, scoffing statement they made was this. He is the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. How did they get into this discourse talking about he's just a carpenter, he's the son of Mary, and his brothers and his sisters live with us? This is how they started talking about that because the question was asked, where did he get all this power from? Where did he get all this wisdom from? And the answer was, he got it from God. And if they would have just answered that question instead of talking themselves out of believing, they would have been saved. They would have received eternal life and they would have seen massive miracles in their hometown, personally in their homes. But instead of talking themselves into Jesus, they began to talk themselves out of Jesus. And while I'm hearing all these excuses or these statements, there's holes in their arguments. Jesus was more than a carpenter. Yes, he was the son of Mary, but he was born of a virgin. That actually points to Jesus being the savior. And the other thing, he came from a normal family. He's just a, his brothers, James, John, they, they all live with us. And what they were trying to do is say, he don't, he's nobody. He comes from a regular, old, normal family. He comes from our hood. You know, there's people that will try to put you down and they'll just, they'll, they'll say, well, he just comes from, they just come from this neighborhood or their family's all like this, but that has nothing to do. Once Jesus comes into your life, you have a new heritage. You have a new ability. You can be somebody you otherwise couldn't be. So when they, when they pointed to Jesus' family, this actually proved, this proves this, that Jesus got his power and his wisdom from somewhere else. It wasn't his upbringing because his brothers and sisters were normal. They weren't teaching. They weren't walking in great wisdom. And none of them were doing miracles. Everything that they said actually pointed or proved that Jesus was more than just a carpenter. Let's look at truth number three. Miracles don't happen where there is unbelief. Miracles don't happen or salvation doesn't happen where there's unbelief. I'm going to give you a sad story. My biological father, we grew up, I told you, in the Virgin Islands in St. Croix in the Little Island. My biological father heard the good news from my mother. My mother shared the good news with him. But not everyone that hears the good news believes. My mother believed, but my father chose not to believe. He refused to believe. And you would say, why did he refuse to believe? Because he did not want to give up his lifestyle. He loves the pleasures of sin. He loved going out every single week weekend, committing adultery, Drinking, getting drunk, getting high. He loved the violence and the fighting and the pride. 
he loved it all. And one day, it was so sad, he told my mother, you'll never go to church again. He stopped her from going to church. He became an enemy to the message. And sad to say it got worse, because I've learned this. If we refuse to believe, our lives don't go on an incline, they go on a decline. Every week, it was getting worse and worse. Every year, he was getting deeper into his addiction. He was becoming more abusive until finally one day, at 32 years old, he got in a gunfight with a bullet between his eyes. He lost his life. He died in a gutter. He got the opportunity to believe just like these people got the opportunity to believe, but my father refused to believe. And because he refused to believe, he never saw the miracle. The greatest miracle of all is a man and a woman receiving freedom, forgiveness, and the gift of eternal life. Truth number three, look at this. Miracles don't happen where there is unbelief. In Mark 6, 4, it says, Jesus told them, a prophet is not honored, is not, is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them. Because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles in that town. Unbelief forfeits miracles. Instead of that town receiving a miracle, they stayed in their lost condition. Today, we have an option. And you might be thinking, if I was in that hometown, I would have celebrated Jesus coming right in. I would have believed, and maybe so. But we also have to put ourselves in the unbeliever's shoes because many times we're the unbeliever. And if we don't believe and we don't place our faith in Jesus Christ, this is what's gonna happen. We stay in our lost condition. You know what that means? We stay sick. We stay bound to the addiction. We stay deceived. We stay depressed, angry, empty, hopeless, suicidal, and lost for eternity just because we refuse to believe. You know, believe it, believe it or not. Believing is so much better than being a non-believer. You know why? Non-believers stay stuck. They don't see miracles. The reason there's billions of followers today of Jesus Christ is because they found out it worked. I couldn't kick the addiction. I couldn't get my stuff together. Every night I went to bed and I was, I was in torment. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't get out of the cycle. I tried the money. I tried the sex. I tried the drugs. I tried the partying and I was still left empty until someone came to me in my broken condition and they told me about Jesus Christ and the day I heard about Jesus, I realized there was hope and I believed and I put my faith in him and he saved me and he forgave me and he set me free and he set me free from the depression and filled my heart with his joy and peace. Everyone has the same story that believes and this is the truth. Everyone has the same story that doesn't believe. Now, there was a few that believed and were healed. The scripture says, and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. This happened over 2,000 years ago. The majority of the city, the majority of the city just determined, we talk, our, we were, the unbelief was contagious. They all just chose not to believe. They thought they were right, but there was a few, maybe one, two, or three, that after Jesus spoke, they believed. And because they believed, these few people believed, Jesus was able to touch them and heal them, was able to touch them and restore them, was able to touch them and give them a brand new life. Today, this is all we need to do. All we need to do is say, okay, I choose to believe. Because as we're hearing this story, you know what's happening? Our faith is being built. And when our faith is being built, you know what that's called? Saving faith. This faith that's being built, this belief that's being built right now, 
can change your life now and forever. Jesus can set you free. You might be thinking, I've been in this depression a really long time. I've been in this addiction forever. I have good news. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Who are you in this story? Are you part of the many that don't believe? Or are you part of the few that say, I believe? And when you believe, this is what God does. He came for you. He left heaven for you. And he came to earth. And right now he's coming to your home. Jesus went to his hometown, but he's coming to your home. He's coming to your car. Right now he's coming to your break room and he's saying, hey, I'm here. I love you. I came for you. Your part is just to believe. And then the miracle happens. But let's look at truth number four. And this is the last one. Only through belief in Jesus can we receive eternal life. Big big statement. In John 3, 16, it says this. Yes, God loved the world so much. And I will say this. Yes, God loves you so much. Just think about this. Jesus was in that town and he came to love the people, to comfort them, to heal their broken heart. And you know what happened to them? They refused to believe and they got offended. Offended because Jesus wanted to help them. I've learned this. If we don't receive the message, this is what, we, what happens. We become an enemy of the message. But I want to re- remind you about something. God loves you so much. Look at the scripture. That he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him would not be lost but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world. He did not send, his, send him to judge the world the, the world guilty, but to save the world through him, through him. And this is the question we have today. Believe or not believe? This question will determine your life today, your family, and your eternal life. It's a question. Do you believe? If you believe, you can be saved today. If you don't believe, this is what's going to happen. We remain the same. It's just going to get worse. And this is the worst thing. We'll be lost for eternity. So Jesus comes to his hometown and he comes today to you. And he's knocking at your heart's door. Do you remember I told you the story about my mom? Someone came knocking at our heart's door. You know who came knocking at our heart's door? It was the little Mexican girl, but you know who it really was? It was Jesus. And you know who's knocking at your heart's door today? It's not me. I, I'm, a, I, I'm a person that got saved when I heard the message. I said, Pastor, when did you, when you get saved? I got saved at six years old. After my dad passed away, this is what happened. My mom took me to church for the first time. That was the first time I went to church. And my mom told me about Jesus Christ, that I could be forgiven, that I could be saved, and I could have eternal life. And I had a choice, believe or not believe. And I chose to believe. And that day, at six years old, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior and the free gift of eternal life. And now I have hope one day I will see my mother again because the same faith she has is the same faith I have. I just chose to believe. Today you can choose to believe. Today you can choose to change your life. It can happen right now. Let's pray. You're a prayer away. The offer is made. Are you going to believe? Are you going to be part of the few that says, yes, I believe? Come to Jesus right now. You don't have to change your life and come to Jesus. You come with your dysfunction. You come with your pain. You come with your broken heart. You come with your mistakes. Jesus did not come for a whole bunch of perfect people. He came for people like you and I. We're all in the same boat. We need some help. We need to be saved. Would you like to know that if you were to die right now, that you'd go to heaven? Would you want to be free and start over and have a great life? Today could start. Let's pray. Just bow your heads. And close your eyes right there in your living room or wherever you're listening. Bow your heads and pray after me. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he's your personal Lord, you'll be saved. Bow your heads, close your eyes and repeat after me. Say this, Jesus, I thank you for not giving up on me. Today, I open my heart's door and I place my trust and faith in you. I realize I'm a sinner and I deserved, I deserve to die or I deserve to be punished. But I believe that you were punished because on my behalf because you love me so much. Today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. 
Forgive me, Lord. I receive the free gift of eternal life. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it, this is what I'm going to say to you. Congratulations. Welcome to God's family. And that's the beginning of your new walk with God. Or maybe you recommitted your life to the Lord. If you said that prayer and you meant it, or you just recommitted your life to Jesus Christ, you said, I've been kind of on the fence. I've been, I've been hanging around the wrong crowd. I've been doubting. But today I recommitted my life to the Lord, or I gave my life to Jesus. Just raise your hand right where you're at. You might be in your home, raise your hand, your car. You might be all by yourself. Go ahead and raise your hand. And, and this is what I want you to do. Let us know. Send us a message, whether it's on YouTube, on Facebook, or go online and check in on the next step. We want to help you grow spiritually. This is the beginning of your new life. Today, you're part of the chosen few that leaves healed and experiencing Jesus Christ. Love you guys so much. You need prayer, just check in. Let us know your prayer request, and we have a team that's ready to pray with you. Love you so much. See you next Wednesday. We're going to have an awesome service. You don't want, you don't want to miss it. We're doing a series, Faith over fear. God bless you. Love you. Have a great Sunday.